So we are uh, trying to get an overview of the most important uh, canonical literature uh, of Hindu Vedantic tradition and this is also considered to be the oldest and the first human document on philosophy and spirituality, Rig Veda Samhita. So many of you must have heard Rig Veda. Uh, you all know there are four Vedas altogether, Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda and Atharva Veda. Rigveda occupies a very unique place because it is the largest of the four Vedas. That is one reason. Secondly, the discovery of Rigveda was a great turning point in the history of Western philosophy, Western religious thought and also Western philology because the language of Rigveda was a great the revolution in modern linguistics. I will talk about this later. Those of you who are more interested in this subject uh, can read uh, the one, some of these well-known books in English, mostly the works of Max Muller, who translated Rigveda, who got edited all these Vedas, um, and he made important contribution to modern linguistics and philology, especially comparative philology. So that is a different subject. Uh, but those of you who are interested can uh, read some of these books. I can name a few important books in English. One is MacDonald Vedic Reader. That is one. Then, of course, Max Muller is the most important contributor to Vedic studies in Western uh, intellectual tradition. Uh, Rigveda Samhita, that's the name of this book, Samhita. So you know, there are four Vedas and each of these Vedas has got four sections. Samhita, Brahmanam, Aranyagam, Upanishad. Samhita is the most important one because it be the largest body of this Vedic literature in each section. It contains hymns, prayers addressed to different deities, different gods and goddesses in Vedic tradition. Who are these goddesses? Those of you, I mean Vishnu, Soma, Agni, Indra, Vayu. Uh, Mitra, all some of these are the names of these gods and goddesses. The early Indians, the Aryan sages, now remember when we use the word Aryan, I want to draw this attention, draw your attention to this point, which is a very important thing. The word Arya, the Sanskrit word, which uh, becomes anglicized Aryan, is really very corrupt anglicization example, a very interesting example of how a, a word can completely lose its meaning. The word Arya in Sanskrit means any cultured, refined, broad-minded, spiritually evolved person with a strong spiritual cultural lineage. That is the real meaning of the word Arya. So the oldest of, uh, some of the oldest of Sanskrit dictionaries, which are in metrical form, in verses, will define Arya, Maha Kula Kulin Arya Sadhya Sajjana Sathavaka. This is a definition, more like, reads like thesaurus, not like dictionary. But it's all in metrical forms, verse. Who is an Arya? Arya is a person. Mahagura means somebody who belongs to an ancient lineage. Sajjana, Sabhya means those who are refined, cultured, of a sattvic temperament, culturally, spiritually, an evolved person. 
who is broad minded so it is a, to be an aryan you should be a spiritually evolved person that word was hijacked and given a very very unfortunate connotation and meaning right from 19th century onwards up to the late uh, some of the early decades of 20th century i am not going into those details so remember in the vedic culture the word arya means somebody well you can say to be buddha was an arya in fact in the buddhist uh, 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 Pali canonical literature, Arja is used, which means Arya. So Buddha was called an Arya, means a refined person, a culturally, spiritually evolved person. No, no, these ancient Aryan sages, they believed in different kinds of gods and goddesses. so you find in vedic literature or rigvedic literature different levels of our understanding human understanding of the absolute reality or god so you find pantheism polytheism panentheism uh, monotheism monism and absolute idealism so six seven stages of evolution in god cat remember this analysis was made by max muller so that also you should remember mostly western indologists try to give a an analysis of the evolution of god cat as they found in vedic literature uh, which of course was an attempt to uh, linguistically and philologically trying to understand the meaning of vedic statements this is not part of india's received vedic interpretation and in the ancient traditional vedic scholars of india may not uh, support the view that there is a gradual evolution but then this is a very wonderful Uh, me- uh, methodology employed by western indologist to understand the growth of uh, uh, the concept i mean the evolution of godhead in vedic literature so means let's say pantheism equating nature with god so the beauty the grandeur the majesty and the mystery of rivers and mountains and valleys and clouds and skies and lightning see lightning just attributed to indra so ocean water is attributed to varuna so uh, why air the mighty storms these uh, natural forces were attributed to vayu uh, like that and the fire principle agni so is one of the most important uh god hits god's i mean concept of concepts of gods in vedic tradition is agni the fire god so what i mean to say uh the early i mean the first at uh, the first stage of their evolution of uh god how do you find pantheism which means equating nature to god the second stage is panentheism which means uh trying to relate the divine principle inherent and in, uh, inherent within the natural phenomena that is the next stage then polytheism behind each of these there is a divine principle guiding regulating uh these natural forces and then there is uh, polytheism and then monotheism which means uh, 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 conceiving a supreme deity as the presiding deity of all gods and goddesses you find the influence of these uh, ideas of vedic uh, pantheon you find in the ancient greek mystery religions and in those religious traditions which prevailed in europe which uh, unfortunately uh, are called pagan religions by later christian uh, missionaries they called paganism they called ancient religious traditions of europe before 
uh, Christianity became the national religion of Roman Empire in 325 AD when Constantine, who became a Christian, imposed Christianity on Roman Empire. Before that, there were a number of uh, very wonderful religious concepts. And one unique aspect of these ancient pre-Christian religious traditions which had prevailed in Europe, which had very close affinity with Vedic religion, one unique aspect of, of these traditions were they were singularly free from fanaticism. Totally free from any kind of fanaticism or intolerance and total acceptance of other uh, tribes, religious concepts, a part of the uh, pre-Christian religions, especially Greek mystery religions in Europe. And then there was this uh, monism, monism close to Advaita, the, I mean conceiving God as a transcendental divine principle which is omnipresent, present everywhere and which is um, immanent, present in everything as the indweller. So you find all these different concepts of God in Rigveda Samhita. Rigveda Samhita was subjected to the most exhaustive studies much more than other Vedas because a large percentage of Vedic mantras uh, found in Yajurveda, Samaveda and Atharva Veda are really found in Rigveda itself. So roughly uh, you find almost uh, 1028 to 1060 hymns. Hymns mean long poems which contains several verses. The, the most, uh, I mean, the most profound, perhaps the, the largest of these hymns contains 190 uh, verses. It was the end of Rigveda Samkhita you find. Some of them contain very few verses. They were called Suktas, S-U-K-T-A-M, Suktam, Sanskrit, which means a long hymn, which contains many verses, many slokas in Sanskrit verses. So altogether there are around close to 11,000 verses in Rigveda Samhita which, uh, which can be divided into roughly around uh, 1,060, maybe 1,060, 1,050, there are different calculations, hymns and all these are divided into 10 sections called mandala. So the whole entire Rigveda Samhita that's what we are discussing now. We are not discussing Upanishads and Aryanagas and Brahmanas of Rigveda. Rigveda Samhita is the mother of Vedic literature. Though it is essentially a book of hymns, it is the cradle, it is the genesis of everything. And it is considered to be the oldest human document on spirituality and philosophy. So, in that Rigveda Samhita, you find uh, these, um, these different deities. Now, uh, to give an example, what did they mean by worshipping different deities? How they evolved in spiritual life? There is one very well known imagery that is found in Atharva Veda, but it is found in Rigveda Samhita. So you find, this is for scholars, if the same verse is found in all the four Vedas, then it was believed that the original source is Rigveda because that is the oldest of the four. Dva Suparna Savija Sakhaya Samanam Vriksham Parishas Sajade Tayor Anya Pippalam Swadati Anasnan Anya Abhichakasi. It's an interesting, you find this as being a subject of many, many discussions and um, um, debates and philosophical studies in modern times. Those of you who are interested in reading English books who are not familiar with Sanskrit can read Raymond Panikir's Vedic experience. He was himself a well-known missionary of both Spanish and Indian parentage who taught in Rome in Vatican, who was teaching Vedas, who was a well-known figure in the um, early half of 
20th century, maybe a little later, as a great linguist and philosopher um, who interpreted Vedas, uh, who was familiar with Sanskrit, Raymond Topanika, in the name of his book is The Vedic Experience. It has got a Sanskrit title, just a title only, Mantra Manchari, you find. So you find, for example, how they evolved, what's meaning of evolution of the Godhead. According to our own evolution, in direct proportion to our own spiritual evolution, our understanding of God also evolves. At the primitive level, we may believe God is somebody or something that activates this natural phenomena. God is the power behind the fire, the air, the water, the clouds and so on. Very similar to the views you find in the Zoroastrian religion, the ancient Parsi religion, and in many of the Greek mystery religions also. God is a divine power that activates natural forces. So from that to the idea that God is one divine transcendental principle, going beyond monotheism, going beyond conceiving God as one big man who, after creating this world, sits above, keeping a close eyes on what we are doing, and certainly not a very compromising person. So, going even beyond that, the idea that God is one divine principle that is present in all of us, that is present everywhere. So, what does it mean? What's the use of one divine principle sitting within our hearts? So the Vedas tell you that you can manifest this divinity within you by living a good life, by being a good man, by practicing prayer, meditation, self-restraint, sense control, by being broad-minded, compassionate and loving, looking upon the whole creation as one spiritual family. Through the practice of these spiritual qualities, the divinity that is within you can come out and manifest and become a matter of experience to you. This belief does not deny the idea of worshipping God in a temple or a church, but it only goes beyond it. So that is the one unique aspect of Vedic concept of religion. It doesn't deny your right to worship God the way you want. That is a very unique principle. That means Vedic religion does not reject any, any view in any tradition. The point is, it only insists that at the highest level, the God whom you worship in your temple or in your church, in your place of worship, that belief, that prayerful attitude of yours to God should express itself in our interaction, in, in our relationship with our human beings, but also in our interaction with the entire nature. So, in this particular verse that I chanted just now, you find, it's an imagery, a tree, in which, on which two birds are sitting. The two birds are identical in color, in shape, in size, in all manners. They are almost, they are completely identical. The difference is one is sitting on the branch above, the other is sitting on the branch below. But there is a difference, the one sitting above, on the branch above, is sitting quiet, composed, contented, tranquil because it identifies itself with the divine principle present everywhere. The other bird sitting on the branch below, it is restless. It tries to eat sweet fruits all the time, but it is not possible. Sometimes it gets sweet fruits, sometimes it gets sour fruits. So it, it becomes happy and unhappy. When we have some bad experience in life, 
we become unhappy. When we have some pleasant experience in life, we become happy. So, the bird below corresponds to human beings, all of us. Sometimes we are happy, sometimes we are unhappy. But the word below so the, uh, is, is, a, is a reflection of our own destiny. The word above is Ishwara, is the divine principle. As the bird ascends towards the higher, uh, towards the high, higher branch, as it evolves, when he reaches close to the other bird sitting on the branch above, which is sitting quiet and contented and happy, then it, ident it understands it ident its identity with the bird above. So what happens? It becomes one with the other one. I mean both the birds become one. Like that, through our spiritual practice, through practicing spiritual disciplines, prayer, meditation and so on, we will be able to go beyond pain and pleasure, eating, eating sweet fruits and sour fruits by transcending pain and pleasure, by reaching the higher region through spiritual practices. So, the bird moves upward, ascends the top branch. Similarly, we also should have a spiritual ascent through spiritual disciplines. And when we do that, we can manifest this divinity within us and we will understand our own divine nature. So as I mentioned earlier, this principle, which actually is the root of Advaita, it doesn't deny other levels of spirituality. Just like a PhD professor will not make fun of a small little kid who is going to kindergarten, who is struggling with his alphabet. Oh, you are a fool. Why are you struggling like, like me? You should, I'm in Harvard. So you should behave like me. A professor will not do that unless he wants to be certified. You know. Similarly, the highest spiritual person doesn't reject any path. So you find a unique verse in the in the Rigveda Samhita, which we have inscribed in our old temple in San Francisco. Indram Mitram Varunam Apnirahu Atho Divyasa Suparno Virutman Ekam Sadvi Prabhuddha Vadandi Agnim Yamam Matarishwanamahu. So the central principle of this verse is Ekam Sadvi Prabhuddha Vadandi. What it means is the reality is one, but sages, inspired sages, call it by different names, give it different definitions in different languages, but the reality is one. So the full verse is, comes in the first mandala, 164th sukta you find. Indram mitram varunam aknirahu atho divyasa suparno garutman ekam satviprabha gudha vadanti Agni Yamam Matarishwanamahu. What it means is Indra, Mitra, Varuna, Agni, all these are different names. Indra was one deity, Varuna was one deity, Agni. Agni is the deity whose name is mentioned first in the first Rigveda mantra. Agni Mele Puro Hidam Yasadeva Murti Cham Hotaram Bhritnathatamam. So Agni Mele, we propitiate, we pray to Agni, that is the first prayer. So all these deities are different names, different manifestations of the same reality. This is uh, the central message of uh, Rigveda Samhita. So there is an evolution from many to one, from external to internal, from gross to subtle. So, those of you, you find Kasmai Devaya Havisha Vithema. To one God should we offer our oblations. Ko Dadarsya Prathamam Jayamanam. Who realized, who understood 
the absolute reality the first born you find many such wonderful ideas in the rigveda samhita which the basis actually the most uh, fundamental basis of interfaith harmony or inter spirituality or interfaith dialogue can be found in the rigveda samhita so which for the first time in human history proclaimed the world that the reality is one different people different religions different cultures different nationalities they try to realize this this reality according to their own conventions so there may be differences uh, with regard to socio cultural conventions geographical conditions food habits in different cultures but the absolute reality is one without the second it is common from for everyone now i i say mention rigveda samhita in the samhita as i mentioned you find a a lot of prayers so uh, in rigvedic times uh, there were not huge temples so that is something very very important for us to remember in the rigveda samhita which uh, corresponds the early vedic a so to speak Uh, historians have tried to analyze the evolution of vedic culture uh, into two the, the early vedic uh, age and the later vedic age in the early vedic age you don't find any mention of temples images or external forms of worship as we find today the construction of huge temples or the ritualistic worship that we find today or evolved much later in hinduism so they used to perform uh, different kinds of worship through prayer and meditation the so worship took the form of not uh, putting flowers in an image but rather doing prayers to the mysterious truth the mystery behind nature and they used to uh, they, they they used to put offering in on burning fire so you find pashema sharada sadam jeevayama sharada sadam sunayama sharada sadam prabhuyama sharada sada shatamadina swayam sharada sadam bhuyascha sharada sada i'm just reading just uh, reciting some of these prayers that they used to recite they used to put offerings on the burning fire so they used to burn fires and this burning fire which is agni the fire was considered to be the messenger who took their offerings to different deities so uh, agni the god agni was called yagna vahaka somebody who carries their prayers and their offerings to different deities that is purohitam so the first mantra rigveda many of you recite some of you at least agnimele purohita purohita actually means somebody who walks in front of you taking your offerings to different deities so they used to utter these mantras which means prayer for long life prayer for uh, the ability to hear to see to live and to prosper for sharada sada means Hundred uh, autumnal seasons. That means let us be blessed with hundred years of life. So, prayer for long life, prayer for uh, prosperity, prayer for uh, progeny. Uh, all these were natural among the uh, Vedic Aryans during the early part of their evolution. but in rigveda mantra sometimes you find in many of these hymns when they used to utter these hymns offering uh, putting offerings on burning fire some of these mantras have got deep philosophical meaning also which is clearly a dwaitic or non dualistic meaning you find some of you in the bay area you know they chant this mantra you know 
अखम राष्ट्रीय संगमनी वसुनाम चिगुदुषी प्रथमा ये किया नाम से देवी सुक्ता परम रुग्वे दशम किया बट इट मेंस इस द वागम ब्रिनी इज द सेज सो इन दिस वेदिक हिम्स वेदिक मंत्रास देर विल बी ए डीटी टू हुम दिस मंत्रा इज एड्रेस्ड एंड देर विल बी ए सेज और ए सेंट Sometimes these ladies, you know, the Vagam Prini was a was a Vedic sage, was a woman to whom this mantra was revealed. So there will be a Rishi, there will be a Chanda, a particular meter, Vedic meter, Trishtu, Anushtu, Gayatri, Savitri. These are different meters in which Vedic mantras were composed, and. It, that this Vedic mantra will be revealed to the saints and sages. So in this mantra, you find this uh, sage prayers. She has realized her own self as the supreme Atman, and she has realized her identity and oneness with the whole creation. So many of these mantras. were not literally composed so that is a very important point we should keep in mind when we talk about vedic culture in fact that is a major difference between the traditional indian approach the that approach of traditional pandits in india and western indologists western indologists frequently try to interpret these mantras as being composed by sages But really speaking, these mantras were revealed. So what it what it could mean is, in the in the in their meditation, many of these ideas came to them, and as these ideas came to them, they recited, and when they recited, their disciples wrote down. So we should remember very well. there is a traditional principle in india and that should be understood whenever we try to make a study of vedas that is vedas were considered to be apaurusheya so apaurusheya means a book or verses which are revealed not physically composed by a person were batting but revealed to them in their hearts in the process of their meditation and again it doesn't have a human origin it is revealed in their hearts so many of these mantras were revealed and they were composed later on by vedic uh, by by the sages so you find uh, uh, the first attempt to study and understand Vedic mantras in India took place around sixth century BC, and the author of that effort was Yaska. He wrote a book called Niruktam. So Niruktam is the first attempt at writing a dictionary or a thesaurus. So what Yaska, the author of Niruktam, did was he took several verses. from rigveda samhita and he tried to interpret some of these names so remember there are close to 11000 verses he took just a few hundreds of verses niruktam is not a large book and rigveda samhita is quite huge so yaska the author he took a few verses a few hundreds of verses from rigveda and he wrote a book more like a description and meaning together like thesaurus it is called nirukta so in the nirukta yaska says sashakra dharman rushayaha vabhuvu te asakshar krita dharma bhya upadeshaya glayanta mantra mantran samprapuhu i am just quoting uh, a statement Uh, written by yaska in the 6th century bc what it means is 
the great sages of India in ancient times, they realized the subtle truths of creation in their own hearts. And then, as they re- realized this sang, which their disciples wrote, they realized. So that's why the word is Sakshakra Dharma Naharushayaka, means they realized this Dharma. So, one uh, definition for Vedas is, uh, is, you know, Sruyade Dharma Anenaiti, Amnayade Sruyade Dharma Anenaiti. So, Veda is something that teaches us from which we hear about Dharma. Dharma means certain eternal, certain eternal principles that keep the world in balance, that sustains the world, that keeps the world in harmony. That's the real meaning of Dharma, you know. Dhrudhadu Dharedi means something that preserves, supports, sustains. So the ancient sages in their meditation they realized some of these great truths and as they realized they sang and as a result these Vedas came into existence. But how do we understand in modern times? Let us say if a person uh, practices certain spiritual disciplines like non-violence, uh, you know, Yamas and Yamas as Padanjali put in later on, you know, according to yoga. Uh, Padanjali Yoga Sutra, Yamas and Yamas, Ahimsa, Satya, Asteya, Brahmacharya, Varigraha, Shauja, Sandosha, Tapaswa, Adhyayi, Sopanithana. Which again Padanjali was trying to put in his own sutra form what ancient Vedic sages wrote about it and, and taught in early centuries. If a person practices some of these spiritual disciplines and practices meditation, then his mind will realize certain subtle spiritual truths. That knowledge doesn't come from books. That knowledge come, comes from the thing. So the highest truth has to come from the thing. So you find uh, one great statement in Rigveda Samhita, 10th Mandala is Sado Bandhum Asadi Niravindan Khridi Pradesha Kavayo Manisha. Those of you who have time, you can read Srishti Suktam, the 10th Mandala, it is called Creation Hymn. There, the Vedic sage tells you, I went in search of the mystery of an explanation for the mystery of the universe. I searched outside everywhere. I could not find an answer to my questions. Finally, Hridi Pradeshya Kavayo Manisha. Finally, Kavaya means Rishaya, means Kavi means Mantra Dashtarka, those who realize the truth of mantras, it's called Kavi, also means point. So this ancient Vedic sages they found the answer to the question of the mystery of the universe. They found the answer within themselves. Hridi means Hridaya Guhaya, within their own hearts. They found an answer, an explanation to the deeper questions of life and existence. So, what it means is, this is the uniqueness of Vedas. When we say the Vedas were, by Vedas we don't mean books. What we mean that they form the accumulated wisdom of sages and saints who meditated and contemplated for a long time. So the Vedas tell you that if we meditate on a mantra or a sacred word symbol with a pure heart, you you grow in an ascending order and eventually you realize the truth of that mantra within your own heart. So that knowledge doesn't come from outside. That knowledge comes from the source of all knowledge, that is the Atman within yourself. That's why in later centuries in the Mantra Shastram, 
you find this para pasiddhi madhyama vaikari there are four stages in our evolution of our understanding of sacred world symbols in all religious traditions you know first we may chant we may recite a sacred word symbol loudly that is at the first stage it's called vaikari and the later stage we may do it in a more subtle manner without making a lot of noise just uh, we hear ourselves vachikam at another stage it become purely mental pashyanti eventually we realize the truth of this mantra ve sacred word symbol in our own heart so vedas are records of great sages who realize the meaning and mystery of the universe in their own hearts and they realize that there are three central principles according to vedas that guide and regulate human life and existence that is satyam rutam and dharma satyam is truth of course we all know dharma as i mentioned is the expression of the satyam the truthfulness in our daily conduct in such a way that our actions our conduct do not disturb the inherent harmony of nature external nature and the harmony of our own inner nature our mind so when we live our life in close proximity with nature and when we practice truth truthfulness in our life then we are living according to the invisible principle of harmony and interrelatedness of nature so that particular phenomenon was called rutam so what is rutam rutam means the invisible interrelatedness and harmony of cosmic existence as explained in the scriptures that is rutam so our life should be lived in such a way that we do not disturb the rhythm the inherent harmony in nature and our interaction with others should be in a way to keep this harmony intact then we will enjoy harmony within ourselves that is the meaning of rhythm and in fact these are these three principles constitute some of the vital teachings of rigveda samhita especially as uh, interpreted by sayana acharya who lived somewhere sometime in 13th century who wrote a commentary on all the four vedas of course that was a later attempt the first attempt was done by yaska in the 6th century bc but that is was only a very marginal attempt in which in the in yaska's niruktam he gave he tried to give some rudimentary meaning of some of the words for example deva shabda what what is the meaning of deva devo dhanadva dipanadva dyotanava dusthano va bhavati iti this means deva means somebody god angel means somebody who will listen to your prayer who will help who will provide who will bestow on you what you are praying for and who will light the candle of knowledge within you and so on pasayana acharya who lived sometime in 13th century he was a great scholar who wrote commentaries on all the upanishads and vedas i mean vedic literature uh, samhita brahmanas aranyakas and upanishads of course upanishads bhashya closely shankaracharya's bhashya he was a great follower of shankaracharya the, he belonged to the shankara tradition he lived during the time of vijayanagara empire so what i mean to say so uh, one of, i mean maybe the most central teachings which are relevant to our times that we can derive from vedas is these three central principles central teaching one is satyam 
dharma and rhythm. The more we move away from, from nature, from this harmonious interrelatedness that you find in nature, the more we will experience disar disharmony within ourselves. So what is the rhythm? See, for example, I mentioned this on many occasions earlier. If you cut down trees, there will be deforestation, there will be a change of climate, there will be less rain, there will be famine. If you pollute rivers and waters, if you pollute the air, if you pollute the earth, there will be consequences. Just, we, we, we may not inherit those consequences, suffer those consequences, our next generation will suffer. So our life should be lived in such a way as to be in close harmony with nature. And that is our dharma, that's our duty. And that is the correct way of following the principle of truthfulness. So, of course, Rigveda Samhita contains many higher ideas. In fact, uh, most of the uh, fundamental principles of uh, Vedanta philosophy, non-dualism, Advaita and Visistha Advaita, qualified non-dualism, Madhva system, dualism and all other uh, different systems of Indian philosophy have their base on Vedas. And when we say Vedas means Rigveda Samhita is important, is the most important document because it is the most exhaustive, as I mentioned earlier. Most of the mantras in other Vedas can be found in Rigveda Samhita itself. And the last sutta is called Aigamatya Sutta. It means let the whole world be one. Looking at the whole humanity as one spiritual family. It is the sukta or the is a song of unity and oneness. The spiritual unity one and oneness of existence. Looking upon the whole humanity, not only humanity, the whole creation. And that's one unique aspect of Veda I want to repeat again. Vedas are, when, when we talk about harmony with nature, Vedas do not mean harmony with fellow human beings alone. Harmony and fellowship extend beyond fellow human beings. It extends to nature as a whole. The trees and mountains and valleys and all that you find included in, Ved in the Vedic prayer, you know, Dev Shanti, Randariksham Shanti, Prithvi Shanti, Oshadaya Shanti, Vanaspadaya Shanti, you find all these prayers. Let there be peace and harmony uh, in the higher regions on earth, trees, herbs, mountains, valleys and rivers, everywhere. So you find the Vedic sages, they had a spiritual fellowship with not only fellow human beings, but also the entire creation, the whole cosmos was included in their spiritual fellowship. Many of the sukta, Hiranyagarbha sukta, Saraswati sukta, we don't know, Imamme, Gange, Yamane, Saraswati, Purushnya, you find these are names of rivers. But sometimes these, the names of these rivers were sometimes used as names of deities in Vedic times, you find. So, uh, that is a mystery. One is extending the spiritual philosophy beyond humanity, embracing the entire creation, including external nature, including the space, the earth, the celestial regions, the trees and mountains and valleys, because they should be happy. Dev Shanti, Andariksham Shanti, Prithivi Shanti, Oshadhaya Shanti, Vanaspadaya Shanti. Oshadhaya Vanaspadaya means, you know, trees and herbs, oceans, they all should be in harmony and peace. Then only our life will be in peace. So, this is a very unique text. Uh, many Western Indologists, beginning with uh, the early German Indologists, then later on, later times, you know, um, uh, Max Muller, Paul Dusen, 
McDonald, and now also there are many Western Indologists uh, who are, of course, the interpretation is sometimes very literary, that's the main problem, because with Vedic, when you interpret and understand Vedas, you should also keep in mind the Vedic culture. Because if you do not try to interpret Vedic mantras, forgetting the cultural background of the Vedas, you may miss many of the deeper implications and meanings of Vedic statements. So, uh, the message of the Vedas, the universal spiritual humanism, the universalism, uh, looking upon the whole humanity, looking upon the whole creation as one spiritual family. We cannot sit in a corner and pray to our God and uh, hate everyone else and we cannot be happy. We cannot pollute the river and pray to God and be and lead a blessed life. It is impossible. You cannot do that. Keeping the nature. So you find Dyao Shanti, Randariksham Shanti, Prithivi, Madhuvata, Rudayade, Madhuksharandi, Sindhavaka, you find let all air, water, mountains, let them all bring sweetness to us, you find. Let it be in state of peace and tranquility. Because nature should be left to itself. Otherwise, nature will retaliate and that's what we are finding today. So that is a different subject. So uh, you are most welcome to ask questions. It is a very extensive topic. I have given many, many lectures uh, related to the Vedas and YouTube you can find in San Francisco's YouTube uh, videos you find. You are most welcome to ask questions. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar Swamiji. Namaskar, Namaskar. Yeah. Um, I have a question, yeah. uh, actually two, two different questions, yeah. so I'll uh, start off with my first question. So uh, when you're talking about these deities yeah. in the Rig Veda, yeah. um, so you, you said that initially there was uh, um, the sense of talking about these, these elements of nature as deities. Yeah. Uh, so later when someone like Shankara came and gave his, uh, his interpretation of the Vedas, yeah. what did he make of the, the deities? What did he yeah. do of that? Did he, how did he explain yeah. the existence of that in the Vedas? Thank you. Very, very profound and relevant question. So I shall approach the subject from two angles. One, one important point to remember is, you know, uh, analysis of this evolution of deities in Vedas was essentially a contribution of Western Indologists, primarily Max Muller. So, uh, Rigveda Samhita uh, doesn't follow uh, in this in in a, in, in, a, in a chronological manner. For example, some of the most profound statements of monisti, monism are found in the first mandala. In fact, in Indramit Ekam Satvipra Bhagavadandi is perhaps the most profound statement of non dualism in Rigveda. It comes in the first mandala, 164th Sukta. Now, the last Sukta of 10th mandala is Aigamate Sukta. Samgichyadvam, Sambhadattam, Sambho, Manam, Sijayanadam, which is actually a call for uh, spiritual unity and oneness, etc. Now, so we should remember, reading the Rig Veda, Western Indologists, as I mentioned, primarily Max Muller, studied traces of this, uh, uh, this pantheistic, panatheistic, polytheistic, polytheistic, and monotheistic and henotheistic and monistic trends in Rigveda Samhita. So that was the analysis that he made which has helped us, which has given a new possibility of approaching uh, a scholarly, new scholarly approach to Rigveda Samhita. You don't find an as in an ascending order one, two, three, first more pantheism, then uh, panentheism, you don't find like that. So that should be kept in mind. 
So it was a systematic analysis of different concepts of God that he found, at least he was employing, he founded the Gveta Samhita when he was employing Western meteorology, okay, and hermeneutics. That is one. Second question is, second part of the question is even more important and relevant. Remember, Shankaracharya lived in the 8th century, 7th and 8th century AD. That was long after Yaska wrote his Niruktam around 6th century BC. Between these, Mahidhara and others, some Imams and others also wrote some commentaries, but not complete. So the first exhaustive commentaries to all the Vedic literature were done by uh, Sayana, who came 500 years after Shankara, 450-500 years after Shankara. Now, what Shankara did, and that, that deserves a special attention, you know what he did? He, in his head, organized all the powerful, profound teachings of the Vedas, and he put them in the form of Upanishads. We do not know if the Upanishads as a compact form existed before Shankara. And that is an important point, remember. There is no evidence that these Upanishads as a separate text existed uh, as part of Vedic literature, as a, as a, as a uh, separate, as an integral, compact form of text existed, uh, detached from the other branches of Vedas. So Shankaracharya in his head, and he was fairly big and quite profound as you know, the amount of work he did, he organized all this and he was giving a philosophical spiritual implication to many of the Vedic mantras. Some of the Vedic mantras which did not apparently have any philosophical implication, have any, any spiritual implication, were given a profound impl implication by Shankaracharya in his commentary. In other words, the fact is, if Shankara had not come and written commentaries on ten Upanishads, we will have no philosophy of Vedas. We will have ritualism, we will have philology, we will have a lot of other things. But this edifice of Vedanta philosophy would not have existed if Shankara had not arrived and given a meaning to Veda mantras. I can see Tattumasi. Tattumasi was interpreted by Mimamsagas in a very ridiculous man. Aham Brahmasmi was interpreted in a very ridiculous man. Aham means the one who performed the Yajnas and Yagas. Brahma means Devata. Asmi means Devata Prapti. So somebody who performs these external sacrifices, praying for wealth and uh, prosperity, he praying to Indra Varuna Akni, he will, uh, he will uh, get identity uh, with the Avada, with Indra Agni etc. That is the meaning of Brahmasmi. You, you read Shankaracharya's commentary of Brahmasmi in the Prakriyar Nigumanishad. It is a profound first Adhyaya, it is a profound Tattumasi. In nine so Brahmanas you find Shankara's interpret so, interpretation. So you find Shankara, what he did, he in his interpretation, he did not reject any of the deities mentioned in, 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 in the Vedas. But he said, there is something beyond that. He did not condemn Imamsagas who were performing yajnas and yagas, praying to these different deities who were pouring offerings on burning fire. He said, there is something higher that you should aspire for. You don't find the word rejection in Shankara's vocabulary. He said, you should transcend this. So, uh, Advaita doesn't reject worshipping different deities. Advaita only goes beyond it. Another thing to remember, you know, many of the Vedic deities later took different forms. See, for example, 
you know, uh, Vishnu was actually a younger brother of Indra in the Rigveda Sankhita. But that Vishnu became Vyapnodi Vishnu. He became Sarvavyapi. He became all pervading deity. So the word Vishnu, the word Vishnu was given etymological interpretation by Vyagaranas and other interpreters. So Vishnu became a great deity. He is in charge of preserving everything, you know. So one of the trinities of Hinduism. So Soma, Rudra became Shiva. Rudra became Shiva. And see, Devi Sukta, you find uh, Aham Rudra, Birva Sivisharami, Durga Sukta, uh, Jadaveda, Sesunavama, Soma, all these. Durga Sukta is the, Devi Sukta is the. You find uh, Durga became a different deity during the Pauranic times, during the intervening 1500 years. You know, there was a great transition from Vedas to Puranic age. So, today's Hinduism is not exclusively Vedic, but its basis is Vedas. But uh, remember the way Tantras and Puranas, these are all, these are all uh, uh, based on Vedic teachings, they are based on Vedas, they accept Vedas as supreme uh, uh, authority, but uh, you don't find uh, that kind of nature worship, you don't find that kind of um, uh, close affinity with nature. In the Taittiriya Upanishad, in the Krishna Yajurveda, you know, in the there is a particular section, it's called Varuni Vidya, this a special kind of meditation is taught, it's called Bhargavi Vidya, because taught by Varuna to his son Bhrugu. So, the Bhrugu uh, went to his father, please teach me uh, Adhihi Bhagavo Brahmedi, please teach me the highest spiritual truth of Brahman. And you know what the father told him, you go and meditate. So, you find Annam Pranam Chakshu Sotram Manovachamiti Yatova Imani Bhudani Jayande Yena Jatani Jeevandi Yeprayanda Visam Visanti Tadvijiknyasa Swata Brahma. So, Varuna doesn't ask Bhrugu to go to a temple and pray. He asked him to go to the forest and sit under a tree and meditate and contemplate and speak, think from where all this matter, energy, senses, mind, all intellect, all these emerge. What sustains them? Towards what they get dissolved in the end. That is the original cause of the universe. You meditate and realize this. Tapasa Brahma Vijiknyasasa through meditation. So what is the means for realizing truth? Meditation. And where you meditate under a tree. Of course, you find in the Vedic literature, you find a lot of imageries. Imageries taken from forests, from trees, from mountains and so on. You know, uh, I mentioned, you know, Imam Megunge, Yamane Saraswati, like that. There are many other mantras in the Muntagopanishad, which Muntagopanishad actually belongs to Atharvaveda, but many of the mantras are from Rigveda Samkhita. So, Edanandya Sindamana Samudri Arthanga Chandi Namaru Pevikaya Tata Namaru Ba Nimatnaha Paratparam Purusha Mubayadi Divya Mundo Upanishad, but it is in Rigveda Samkhita, what it says, you know, just like so many rivers, they flow to the ocean, to the ocean. When the rivers merge with the ocean, when all the waters merge with the ocean, those rivers lose their individual identities. They become one with the ocean. Similarly, when we reach the highest spiritual experience, all these diversities and differences in terms of different deities, different kinds of worship, all of them disappear, they all merge with the ocean of inner spiritual experience. So here also you find the imagery is taken from rivers, oceans. That's an interesting thing. Anyway, uh, thank you for your question. I, I hope it's okay with you now. Right? Thank you, Swamiji. Swamiji, the other question is that um, yeah. you were uh, talking about the various stages of understanding the Rig Veda, yeah. uh, starting from, say, pantheism based uh, yeah. understanding, and then there's pantheism, polytheism, yeah. monotheism, yeah. and then Shankara's monism. Um, so, 
and and then later you mentioned just now that shankara uh, all of this organizing happened in shankara's head and then shankara they gave us an organized view of the vedas yeah. but otherwise the uh, the verses were sprinkled across the rigveda so yeah. uh, is it right in assuming that um, the rigveda does not take any of these uh, positions uh, of say pantheism or monism or monotheism yeah you are right rigveda we cannot say rigveda takes one side or other side no mm-hmm. you see, yeah we cannot say that so again shankaracharya was concerned only with the upanishad portions you know the upanishad portions he did not write a commentary on uh, rigveda samhita mantras you know upanishads constitute the highest philosophical portions of vedic literature brahmanas deal with rituals arena deal also like with different hymns and rituals samhitas are exclusively dedicated to different hymns addressed to different deities but what shankara did you know he was concerned only with the most philosophical portions of the entire vedic literature but remember that is something where it should be kept in mind uh, many of the mantras in upanishads which traditionally belong to non rigveda are taken from rigveda samhita itself so samhita portions which are supposed to be uh, dedicated to deities and prayers and rituals those samhitas themselves contain very profound mantras which later shankara included in the upanishads so where do you draw the line so the concept of classifying into water tight compartments and divisions and which are uh, characteristic of modern times that did not exist in those days you know so you have to think of that age so many of the mantras which are very profound uh, uh, which actually belong to upanishads uh, can be found in rigveda samhita they first appear in rigveda samhita many of the upanishad mantras are rigveda mantra even now what i call dwa suparna saujya it is from mundaka upanishad it is from rigveda samhita itself in fact the at the most profound statement in entire vedic literature is ekam sati prabhu gudha vadanti truth is one she is called by different names now that is found rigveda samhita not in upanishad really so but the entire upanishad deal with the subject so we should we should be very careful um, in modern times we have we draw clear lines of demarcation that was inconceivable in ancient times thanks so much yeah so yeah i have a question uh, today uh, uh, we all know that uh, veda vyasa he also was a big player in the puranic literature yeah and on top of that um, uh, that derivation from rigveda to puranas derivation from rigveda yeah. to uh, the, the, the the deep connection into uh, you know from for instance uh, uh, we say that uh, 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 dharma uh, that is yudhishthira came from uh, you know uh, mitravarna yeah. or uh, you know the ashwins are uh, nakula and sahadeva yeah, yeah. uh, now those uh, kinds of uh, serious derivations uh like is everything in in terms of hindu literature for instance, including the upanishad they all derive from uh you know smaller uh, uh concepts from the rigveda or yeah, one, various rigveda yeah one way or other is related to rigveda but vyasa you know vyasa uh, this is a very controversial subject and highly debated everywhere uh you he we hear about vyasa Uh, classifying the vedas again vedas were much more ancient than puranas and veda vyasa wrote puranas and you find mahabharata is comparatively very modern and uh, and vyasa wrote mahabharata also so it's a bit confusing so some of the modern historians and linguists they say that vyasa was not a single person it was a lineage of sages or saints or scholars 
I mean saintly scholars who wrote in a one family or one lineage, you know. Um, uh, uh, several Vyasas appeared in the same lineage, so different, there were different Vyasas, so that is one view. Uh, but remember, Vedas constitute the supreme authority in all matters of Hindu Vedantic tradition, not only in philosophical or spiritual matters, but even cultural matters. When there is a controversy between, when there is a conflict between the opinions of Smritis and Puranas and Vedas, the authors of Puranas themselves declare Veda should be taken as the final authority, as the only authority. That's a very important point. Sudhi Smudhi Puraneshu Sudhireva Giriyasi Avilodhitu Sadakaryam Smartam Vaidika Vasada Vyasaran Vyasa Smudhi what he says Whenever there is a conflict between what the Vedas say on a subject it will be a cultural subject, it will be a philosophical topic, it will be a conventional ritual whatever it is it may be, so it may have something to do with how you should conduct your ritual in your home the final and the ultimate authority is the statement from the Vedas. When the statements from the Puranas do not run contrary to what the Vedas say, then only Puranas do have an authority. Vedas constitute the final and ultimate supreme authority. Excuse me, what is your name? You are... Can the question ask? Oh, I am Srinivasan. Yes, Srinivasan. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is an important point, remember. We have a tradition that in all matters of uh, religion, philosophy, rituals, conventions, beliefs, Vedas constitute ultimate and central authority. Vedas are so democratic, that's the only term we can use, and so harmonious and so universal. See, so Vedic values, values from Rigveda, uh, they are so universal. So remember, uh, Vedas flourished long before what we now understand in Hinduism came into existence. Vedas constitute the foundation, the genesis. But remember, Vedas in the Vedic tradition you don't find it's a, just it, it just a description of. Uh, our journey in search of higher ideas, higher knowledge, higher realizations. It's a story of human quest for truth. That's why you find um, many modern scholars have seen this close connection between uh, the teachings of the Vedas and also uh, and Zoroastrian religion, pre-Christian European uh, religious traditions like pagan religious traditions, you know, where they used to revere nature. They used to, uh, because they did not believe that God created uh, the world for human beings to enjoy at the cost of non human beings, you know. We have to live in close harmony and friendship and affinity with the whole creation. So that idea you find in the Vedas, especially Rigveda Samhita. They don't show a line, yeah, well, we are all highly civilized people with a lot of technology. We can make use of all that nature has got for our own comforts. That idea you don't find uh, in the Rigveda Sangha. It is so, it's so universal. You may call it primitive, but there is a spiritual depth to that primitive nature. You know. There is a there is an inherent spirituality in the approach of Vedas. And it, again it addresses the whole humanity, the whole creation. That's why Max Muller and other Indologists were fascinated because there is pantheism, equate nature with the divine, there is panetheism, this divine principle within different natural uh, phenomena. There is politism, there is a divine hand behind everything. There is a monotheism, there is a supreme deity presiding over everything. 
and of course there is a transcendental spiritual principle monism or atvaita so all they found so western indologists they were trying to look for things that they were familiar with and they found everything there so you so you find if you if you read uh, in modern times if you read uh, toros walden you find this man going in search and he was so he was living close affinity with nature moving from place to place you know enjoying the mountains and valleys and trees and uh, forest you find you find and he he perhaps a full a translation of rigveda was not available but he said he got a um, portion with translations and he was highly fascinated because there you find how human beings can be friends with nature friend we can be friends with trees and mountains uh, it's a collective existence mm-hmm. of cosmic existence so that is the uniqueness of rigveda samhita rigveda is important because it is the first a uh, human document uh, it is is also the most exhaustive uh, very portion that's why. thank you for all those questions and these questions are very helpful for me to explain things that i wouldn't have left out in my talk thank you om shanti 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 hari hi om tat sat sri ram krishna namastute